Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night uh, Bible study as we continue our series, Son of God and Son of Man, and this is a fresh study of the Gospel of Mark. We've just begun getting into the narrative of Jesus' life that Mark uh, presents. Last week, we focused on the prologue of Mark's Gospel, which is the first 15 verses of chapter 1. And these verses were important to spend a considerable time in because Mark reveals to us right at the outset who Jesus is. He is the Messiah and the Son of God. And the, John the Baptist prepares the way uh, for Jesus by calling people to repentance. And Jesus is empowered uh, for his ministry by the Spirit at his baptism. And Jesus passes tests in the wilderness that Israel had been uh, unable to pass. And then the prologue ends with Jesus himself proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. And by the time the prologue ends, Jesus' ministry and mission has begun. Israel's Messiah and God's Son is actively working in the world and actively working among God's chosen people. And the first thing we read of Jesus doing after proclaiming the good news in Mark is calling disciples. So we're going to spend some time tonight focusing on these disciples and what it means to be a disciple and what we learn from early in Jesus's ministry about truly following him. I asked uh, last week that you read uh, chapter 1 verses 16 through 20 and then also chapter 3 verses 13 through 35. That's what we're going to be in tonight. That might have sounded a little bit weird that, to skip around like that, but that's because we're not doing a verse-by-verse walkthrough of the entire Gospel of Mark. We are focusing on Mark's narrative presentation of Jesus, but I think we will grasp that presentation a little bit better if we group some things together based on their themes and based on their content. So some weeks it may seem like we're skipping around a little bit, but there will always be reasons for that, and hopefully those reasons will be clear uh, each week. And so the passages that we will be in tonight reveal to us something about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. They also reveal to us something about the people who were not so keen to follow Jesus and what their opposition to Jesus looked like. So immediately after we read of Jesus proclaiming the gospel, we read that he encounters uh, fishermen, Simon and Andrew, as he is passing along the Sea of Galilee. And he calls them to follow him, and they do. And then he encounters two more fishermen, uh, James and his brother John, uh, whom he also calls, and they also follow him. The fact that Jesus is calling disciples at all is actually pretty significant, because in Jesus' day, most teachers and, and rabbis did not seek out disciples. People instead sought to become disciples of teachers. People would seek out teachers instead of the other way around. But not so with Jesus. He is actively calling out people to follow him. And notice how Jesus words his calling uh, of these four uh, people here in uh, chapter 1, verse 17. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. This fits, this call fits with the context of calling fishermen at the Sea of Galilee. Andrew and Simon are casting a net. A little bit later, James and John are in boats and they are mending their nets. And the fishing industry was naturally very prominent around the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus says that he will make them into different kinds of fishermen. They will become fishers of men. They will fish for people. In other words, they will do to others what Jesus has just done to them. Jesus has sought them out, and if they follow Jesus, then they will become people who seek out others as well. They will seek out people for the kingdom of God, uh, which is the kingdom that Jesus just proclaimed in the, in the previous verse right before he calls uh, these people here, right? In verse 15, he's proclaiming that same kingdom. This is the beginning of the disciples' journey in the Gospel of Mark, and it's not an easy journey. And we will see as we go along that instead of faithfully representing Jesus at all times and understanding him, uh, these disciples are often confused and they struggle to understand Jesus. Mark really does not paint the most glowing picture of the disciples. Becoming fishers of men is a process for these disciples. And thanks to the rest of the New Testament, and I'm mainly thinking of the book of Acts, but also other places in the New Testament, we see that some of Jesus' disciples become very effective fishers of men after Jesus' resurrection. But Mark records their initial steps in becoming these new kinds of fishermen. 
Mark records their response to Jesus' call to follow him and become something new. And notice Mark tells us here that they immediately leave their nets to follow Jesus. This sense of immediacy is going to be a continuing part of how Mark tells his narrative of Jesus' life. Um, Be on the lookout because the word immediately, this is a word that is going to become commonplace in Mark's gospel, and he will use it as a way to propel the narrative uh, forward with a sense of urgency and a, a quick pace. But here in this passage, With the word immediately, we're struck by the willingness of the disciples to just leave their fishing business behind and follow Jesus. Now, it's worth mentioning that this isn't necessarily the first time they've ever heard of Jesus. If Jesus has been preaching around Galilee for a while, then they likely already knew something about him, and they may have even already heard him preach and teach before. It's also important to remember that in the first half of Mark, they mostly just follow Jesus around Galilee itself, which is not a very big region. And so following Jesus for them didn't necessarily mean that they would never see their families again or never be involved in their fishing business again. I think those things are important to keep in mind. But these things do not change how willing they are to leave what they are doing right then and follow Jesus. And Jesus calls them and they make a break with their present life to go off in a new direction in response to Jesus' call. And this will involve time away from family and time away from loved ones. And so this is not a small commitment by uh, these men. And as Mark progresses, as the gospel progresses, we will see uh, just what all this commitment entails. The next passage uh, early in Mark that's related to the disciples uh, that we're going to be in tonight is in chapter 3. And we'll see this uh, in future weeks, but by this point in Mark, by by the time we get to chapter 3, Jesus is already making quite a splash in Galilee. Uh, Crowds are turning out to follow him. And from amongst these crowds of followers, Jesus selects 12 to be especially close followers. And he calls these followers his apostles. Now, you may have heard before that the term apostle refers to someone who is sent by someone else. And that is correct. Uh, These men are going to be Jesus' representatives. And again, we'll see as we go along just how much they struggle to even understand Jesus and Mark, much less represent him. But we know from the rest of the New Testament that they will grow into this role. And notice the roles Jesus has in mind for them as apostles. First of all, uh, he wants these men to be with him. And secondly, he wants to send them out to preach and cast out demons. Now, the second part of, uh, of, of this role fits with what being an apostle means. They will preach and cast out demons on Jesus' behalf. They are sent by him, and they represent him. But also, when these men aren't being sent out, they will be alongside Jesus in his ministry in a way that the crowds who follow him will not. There will be a greater level of fellowship and discipleship and friendship here uh, among Jesus and these 12 men. The number 12 is significant here because it corresponds to the 12 tribes of Israel. There is symbolic significance to Jesus selecting specifically 12 apostles. This is especially significant because at this time, there aren't 12 tribes of Israel living in the Promised Land. You may remember from the Old Testament that the 10 tribes that made up the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, they were taken into exile and they never returned. Only those from the southern kingdom of Judah returned from their own separate exile by the Babylonians. So by having 12 apostles, Jesus is making a statement about who he is and what will happen through him. The restoration of Israel is connected to Jesus. And this fits with his role as Messiah and as Son of God. Through Jesus, the people of God are going to be renewed. Now, we know uh, from the rest of the New Testament that the people of God uh, are going to extend beyond the literal tribes of Israel and beyond Judaism to include all nations, to include the Gentiles. The average Jew wouldn't necessarily pick up on anything like that just from seeing Jesus call 12 apostles, but they would probably pick up on the type of statement Jesus is making about the future of Israel and his role in that future by having this many apostles follow him and represent him. Now, right after Jesus calls these apostles, we read an extended passage that demonstrates what following Jesus is really all about. And we also read what opposing him is all about as well. 
This type of passage is commonly called a Markin sandwich passage. This is a writing technique that Mark uses a lot in his gospel. A Markin sandwich works a lot like a real life sandwich. Um, with a real life sandwich, you have bread on either side and then you have something in the middle. And each part of the sandwich is meant to enhance the overall flavor and texture of the sandwich. Well, a sandwich passage takes one narrative and splits it in half while inserting another narrative in the middle. And then these two narratives interpret one another. We are meant to read them together and see their overall significance. And we will see several uh, Markin sandwiches over the course of this series. But here, in the first part of our sandwich for tonight, Jesus is at his home, which at this point is Capernaum. He was raised in Nazareth, but then he moved to Capernaum. Jesus is at his home, and crowds are eager to see Jesus, and these crowds are large. And notice verse 21. Jesus' family wants to seize him because they think that he is out of his mind. Now, this could mean that his family actively opposes Jesus' ministry at this point, and they want to put an end to it. Or it could mean that they are afraid for Jesus, and they want to get a hold of him before the religious authorities get a hold of him. And uh, this would also be a way that they could protect their honor in this situation, in an honor-shame culture like the one that they are living in. But either way, Jesus' family clearly have, they have clearly seriously misunderstood Jesus and his ministry uh, as word about him has spread. And at the end of our Mark and Sandwich, Mark will direct our focus to Jesus' family again. We will come back to Jesus' family at the end of this section. And then the middle part of our sandwich comes in verses 22 through 30. While Jesus' family is saying that he is out of his mind, Scribes from Jerusalem who have come to Galilee and are learning about Jesus, uh, they say that his ministry is empowered by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Now by this point in Mark, Jesus is not only teaching and preaching, he is also performing miracles and casting out demons. And we will look at some, of, some instances of this uh, in future weeks in here. But Jesus is doing these things by this point. And Beelzebul was another name for Satan. So Jesus is casting out demons, but the scribes argue that Jesus is himself possessed by demons, and, and he can only cast out demons because Satan is empowering him to do it. Now, if that logic sounds backwards, it is. And Jesus is about to say that it is. Notice what he says here uh, in response to this charge. Notice what he says in verses uh, 23 and 24. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And then Jesus will continue this line of logic, saying that just like a kingdom divided or a household divided is bound to crumble, uh, so would Satan's forces crumble as well if Satan is casting out Satan. And so Jesus is showing how backwards uh, the logic of the scribes uh, is. Then, after that, Jesus makes a strong statement against the scribes that has caused um, no small amount of discussion, and it has also caused quite a bit of anxiety for a number of conscientious Christians. In verses 28 through 30, Jesus talks about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and he says that blaspheming the Spirit is an unforgivable, it is an eternal sin. All other sins and blasphemies will be forgiven, but not this one. I don't really want to focus on this for too long because I want us to focus on the bigger picture of what is going on, but this is a troubling passage, and many Christians have at times wondered if they have been guilty of this eternal sin. After all, the idea of committing a sin and having no opportunity for forgiveness and being permanently excluded from eternal life, that sounds quite terrifying. We know that God does not desire for anyone to perish eternally, and that he desires for all people to repent and have eternal life. We know that God loves the world so much that he sent his only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We know from 1 John 4 that God is love. God is so full of love for his creation that 1 John can simply say that God is love. It is an inseparable part of who he is. And we see example after example in the Old Testament and the New Testament 
of God's love overcoming sin and evil and his re- desire for redemption ultimately triumphing over, triumphing over all kinds of sin. God never permanently abandons his people and he never permanently abandons humanity. These are not minor or debatable points about God. These are major themes of scripture and primary aspects of who he is. And so in light of all these things, is it really likely that amidst the whole mass of sins that humanity can commit, there is one sin that God's love simply cannot overcome with forgiveness? That sounds kind of hard to believe. This idea would also seriously challenge the teaching that God is love and that he desires all people to be saved by turning from their sins. So perhaps instead of seeing here one sin that is unforgivable among the mass of forgivable sins, maybe there is a better understanding of this passage. Notice here how far the scribes are willing to go to dismiss Jesus' ministry. They are willing to adopt the backwards logic that Satan is empowering Jesus to overcome Satan's own forces. They are really reaching at this point. And we'll see next week in this class that this is not the first time religious leaders have been opposing Jesus. This has been going on for a while, and this is where things kind of come to a head. The problem is not that they accidentally stumbled across the one sin that can't be forgiven when they made this statement. That's not the problem. The problem is that they are determined to find a way to dismiss what God is doing through Jesus. If they are so determined that they cannot even acknowledge God's power when it is right in front of them through his spirit, then there is really nothing else God can do to reach them. Acknowledging that God's spirit is at work, that is their avenue to following God's will and being on God's side. And they are closing themselves off to that avenue. And they're not doing this out of ignorance. They're not doing this out of spiritual immaturity. They're doing this out of a determination to not acknowledge what God is doing. And if they are closing themselves off to God's avenue for being on God's side, then there is no hope for them. It is truly an eternal sin. Now, if this understanding is correct, the sin is not an eternal sin, regardless of whether or not they repent. Instead, it is eternal precisely because they are so determined to oppose God and thus not repent. But like all sins, God's love can overcome this sin with forgiveness when people repent of opposing his work so boldly and opposing his work with such a hard heart. But as long as the scribes' hearts are this hard, they make themselves incapable of repentance and therefore guilty of an eternal sin. I know I said I wouldn't spend too much time on this part of our passage for tonight, and I ended up kind of doing that, Um, but it's the type of passage that requires being thoughtful and thinking about it in relation to bigger themes of Scripture uh, to help us make sense of it. And if this understanding is correct, I think it's safe to say that anyone who is worried about committing the eternal sin has not committed it, because if they are worried about it, that is a good sign that they are seeking repentance, and the eternal sin needs unrepentance in order to have lasting power. Now, if I said anything in this discussion about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and and the uh, eternal sin, if I said anything here that was unclear, or if you have any more questions about this, uh, please contact me in some way and and we can discuss this some more. But I think that this is um, the more faithful way to interpret this passage in light of the rest of Scripture. But anyway, uh, let's get back to our Mark and Sandwich now. Jesus' family, uh, we read in the first part of our sandwich, Jesus' family thinks that he is out of his mind and they want to seize him. And then in the second part of our sandwich, the religious leaders think he is possessed and so they definitely want Jesus' ministry to stop. And now we come back to Jesus' family for the third part of this sandwich. Jesus is at home with these crowds all around him. His family is outside trying to reach him, but the crowds are in the way. And so word of their arrival kind of travels through the crowds and reaches up to Jesus. And notice what Jesus says here. Uh, This is uh, verses 33 through 35. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus is focused on a different concept of family, and it doesn't consist of his blood relatives. It consists of those who do the will of God. 
Notice here verse 34. Jesus is looking around at those who were crowded around him as he says this. These people who are around him, these are his true family. By that standard, Jesus' biological family is not his real family. And neither are the religious leaders, the people who are best placed to be actively doing the will of God. Instead, those who truly do the will of God are those who follow Jesus. These people are Jesus' family. They are his brother, his sister, and his mother. So the theme of opposing Jesus uh, runs all the way through our Mark and Sandwich. And some of these opponents are confused, like Jesus' family. Others are determined to oppose him, like the scribes. But at this moment, neither group belongs to Jesus' true family. Neither are doing the will of God. The crowds who are flocking to Jesus for healing and for teaching, they are the ones who are doing the will of God, and they are the ones who are Jesus' true family. So what do we learn about Jesus calling disciples in these passages that we've looked at tonight? I think that this is important to reflect on because as followers of Jesus today, we also are his disciples. Well, first, we see Jesus calling disciples, much as he calls us today through the gospel. And following him means change. That's something else we see. Following him means change. It means becoming someone who will in turn make more disciples. But as we will see throughout our study of Mark, this is not an overnight change. For these disciples, this is going to be a long road. We also see that being a disciple means both learning from Jesus and being sent out by Jesus. Just like Jesus chose the apostles to both be with him and to go out into the world and represent him. We also see that being his disciples makes us into a family. We become family to Jesus, and, and by extension, we become family to one another. And this is not just a nice sentiment here. This bond is meant to be closer than the bond of blood relations. True family is found in doing the will of God together. And last of all, remember the significance that we talked about of Jesus calling 12 apostles. Jesus makes a statement through the symbolism of calling 12. In him, Israel will be restored. The people of God will be renewed. When we follow Jesus, we become part of the people of God. We become God's chosen people. We fulfill God's ultimate plans for Israel. And those plans go all the way back to the call of Abraham. And we do this together as disciples of Jesus who make more disciples and, and who have each other as family and who do the will of God together. And that is powerful. So next week, I'd like you to read chapter 2 and verse 1 through chapter 3 and verse 6. So just a little bit over one chapter. That's the section of Mark that we will be in uh, for next week. So if you can have that read, I think that will help us uh, engage this material uh, next Wednesday night. But thank you all. Hope you all of you are doing well. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you.